Hello everyone, my name is Loco and welcome to some more StarCraft 2 Legacy of the Void. Today I got a little bit of a weird game for you. This is a game that I played a couple of days ago over at the live stream and even though it was a little bit less serious, I think some of you might still be able to take away a couple of things from this match. So this is going to be a Zerg versus Terran and like I said, it's a little bit less serious. Now I'm going up against uh, a Terran opponent here who is still going to be either in Grandmaster League or very high up on the Master League ladder. He's going to be a high level Terran player and and the chat on the live stream, because this was played on the live stream, was talking about the different matchups that Zerk has. So people were discussing how Zerk vs Protoss and Zerk vs Zerk are relatively set in stone. If you look at those two matchups, you're never really going to be able to wiggle around all that much. And while there's some cheese and some shenanigans that you can do, most of the games are going to be based around one or two concepts. So for example, in Zerk vs Protoss, you're pretty much always going to go Roach Ravager into Hydralisk, into Lurker. And while you do play all of the Zerg units, and while it's a really dynamic matchup in that sense, you can't really decide your strategy right from the get-go. As if your opponent is going to do anything whatsoever, you're going to have to respond accordingly. And as far as Zerk vs Zerk, Zerk goes, basically all of the early game is going to be dominated by Zerklings and Banelings, and if you decide to skip those and go straight against the, or into a Roach Warren, for example, if you're going up against high level people, they're going to be able to punish that right from the get go. So, Zerk vs. Terran is really the matchup where you're allowed to wiggle around a little bit more and where you're allowed uh, to really try out different strategies and different compositions. At the very least, uh, that is what my understanding of the game is so far. Now, Obviously, I've been playing for many, many years, and uh, the game is always changing, but at the very least, at this point in time, I think that's a relatively safe assumption that Zerk vs. Terran is going to be the one matchup where you're allowed to mess around a little bit more. So, I decided to challenge myself a little bit here. I let the chat decide what units I should be playing in this game, and they come up with two units in total. I basically decided the very first one, Zerklings. I mean, that's going to be that's gonna be one of the dominant, uh, dominant units that you really, you know, you gotta have the option to, at the very least, make some Zerklings, but the chat came up with me to also play Ultralisk, and those are going to be the only two units that I am allowed to play in this match, and that's exactly what I'm going to try and achieve. I'm going to be prim uh, primarily playing with Zerklings here early on, and the reason for that is just because Zerklings are going to be really, really powerful. Now, obviously, I'm still allowed to make Queens. Queens are absolutely mandatory, and because of that very reason, uh, we're changing up our strategies a little bit. So, I know at the beginning of the match, that in this in this match, I'm only allowed to play with Zerklings and with Ultralisk uh, as my actual army composition, right? So, I'm gonna be focusing on a composition based around those two units. However, how exactly does that change my early game? As many of you will be aware, I play quite a little bit of Roach Ravager, but on this map in particular, I actually play quite a lot of Mutaling Bane as well. Now, I'm not allowed to go for Roaches, I'm not allowed to go for Ravagers, I'm not allowed to go for Mutalisk or for Banelings, so that means I I need to sort of like make sure that I'm gonna be at least relatively safe in the early game and I'm gonna do so by creating extra Queens. So here's my thought process, right? If my opponent is gonna be going for any kind of drop play, I need to be capable of getting my army to that drop location right from the beginning. And on top of that, I need to find something that I can snipe the Metavex with, right? So I need to make sure that I'm also gonna be getting at least several extra queens just to deal with the potential aggression that my opponent is going to be throwing at me and because of that i think i check up to either like six or maybe even eight queens and surprisingly enough this is something that i always recommend to people that are um you know in somewhere in the lower leagues as zerk versus Terran goes always um i'm always a little bit surprised by the strength of queens i mean Queens are never really going to be that terrible of a decision, as long as you are spending all of your larva and you got enough income to support adding on extra queens, as long as you're microing them, they're actually really, really good. They allow you to snipe the early game pressure, basically all of the early game aggression in Zerg vs Terran can be countered by just a handful of queens, and on top of that, queens are gonna be really helpful for the creep threat, they're gonna be really good in late game transitions as well, because you're gonna be capable of, for example, transfusing your Ultralisk. Now, I like the idea of going for the Ultralisk and Zerklings, and the reason for that is that I need to tech up really quickly, and since I'm not going to be spending any resources on Roach Warrens, I'm not going to be getting any resources spent on, on Infestation Pit, or well, I guess I need to get an Infestation Pit, but on any other unit composition really, I am basically capable of teching up straight towards the Hive. And because of that, I can spend all of the gas, any income, and everything that I'm getting on just this limited amount of units, right? So that means I can really heavily upgrade my Zerklings. 
Now, I'm going to try and do so right from the get-go. I'm going to tech up extremely quickly here. Uh, and I'm also going to be getting some uh, some safety spore crawlers right now. This is something I do in every Zerg vs. Protoss. Uh, in Zerg vs. Terran, however, obviously I don't make blind spore crawlers because normally you have roach warrants uh, and ravages and whatnot to deal with it. But everything considered, this works out relatively well. Now you will notice here that I am going to start falling behind a little bit in supply and this is because most of the time at this point in the game as a Zerg player you're going to be focusing on an army based around roaches and ravagers and roaches and ravagers always inflate the amount that you have. But here we go. So here's the very first aggression that my opponent is going to throw at me and this is super standard right now. They go for this double medevac aggression into liberator play. That's like the super like golden standard right now for Terran and here's my idea. I'm going to be using the first group of Zerklings that I made right here as a counterattack. So notice my hotkey setup here. I got my first group of Zerklings here as a counterattack. I see the Liberator come in, but at the same time, I got a second group of Zerklings here for home defenses. So I know there's still going to be, you know, that group over there, but I'm going to start attacking here. I'm going to start counterattacking with the initial batch of Zerklings that I made. On top of that, I got obviously a little bit of aggression here in my natural mineral line. I will need to move the Spore Crawler over just a tad, but after that one did successfully move over I'm gonna be sending the workers back to mining now at the same time right my opponent is progressing onwards but I've cleaned up a nice chunk of his army now here's what I'm also trying to achieve with the Queens I'm target firing down the metavax as you can see early game defense actually went relatively smoothly early game defense how many workers did I end up losing there I ended up losing uh, two workers in total a very very small amount but in particular the zirkling run by and the double pronged aggression turned out to be really really helpful on top of that, even though I skipped out the Roach Warren, right, it allowed me to get some additional resources out to add on extra Queens. And look at the creep spread, right? Even though my creep spread has even has not even been remotely perfect here, and it's definitely still room for improvement, creep spread is looking absolutely ridiculous already, and... You know, at this point in the game, I'm in a really, really, really powerful position. I still have a lot of Zerklings left over. I got upgrades going up. I will be able to start tacking up towards the Hive really quite easily here as well. And I know that my opponent doesn't really have an army to counter. Now, I know that some of you are going to be saying like, hey, obviously this works out in this particular case, right? Uh, but what if your opponent would have gone for massive amounts of Hellions? Well, I think I would have been fine against the standard you know, 6, 8, or 10 Hellion play. I think I would have been fine against that. Now, that said, obviously, if my opponent would have gone for the Blue Flame Hellbird aggression, I would have been in a lot of trouble. You're either gonna need Mutalisk or, you know, Roach Ravager in order to deal with that, and I simply don't have those units. But to be completely honest with you, that composition and that aggression is something that we saw a lot a half year ago. There's a lot of, like, meta and stylistic changes that you can do as Zerk, and, uh, or that you can see in StarCraft, and Honestly, in this particular case, I'm just adding on more and more queens, and I would have hoped that my queens would work out in that particular or in that particular scenario. Now, I understand fully well that in many cases, that's obviously not going to be great. It's not going to be a foolproof solution, and I would never really recommend skipping out both the Roach Warren as well as the uh, the Spork or as well as the, uh, the the Spire. But all in all, you know, if you if you are aware of the current state of the game, and you are aware of the current situation and the strategies and the tendencies that players have in StarCraft, oftentimes you can do quite a little bit of work. Now, I do still have a lot of queens out. As you may have already noticed, I think I got like 10 or so. Yeah, I got 9 queens at this point in the game. That's a heck of a lot. That's a heck of a lot of queens. And while there's still some, uh, some liberator aggression here as well, I'm gonna have to make sure that I deal with that eventually, right? I need to make sure that I push forward here, got a lot of transfuse over, and... As you may be aware, Blizzard is currently um, trying to see what buffs they should give to Zerk. And Zerk is apparently going to be getting a buff in the anti-air range of the Queen. Now imagine having some additional range here on the Queen's right. I would have easily cleaned up all of this early game pressure from my opponent. And at which point I would have been in a super, super powerful position. I wouldn't need to make 9 Queens, right? I probably would have been able to get away with like 6 and go for the exact same strategy. Now here is where the game gets a little bit more tricky, okay? This is this is where it's pretty apparent that going for massive amounts of Zerklings isn't working out brilliantly, but at the very least this should indicate to you that it's an option, it's a powerful solution to a problem that you may be having. If you make enough Queens, you can hold on to a lot of early game pressure. Now I'm already getting up to a high fear at 9 minutes, I actually started it during the 8 minute mark, somewhere around 8 minutes and 50-ish. 
Uh, however, this is where it's pretty apparent that going masling is not that great. So plus two plus two upgrades did just finish up in the evolution chamber and I'm gonna start moving across the map. It coincidentally is also the time where my opponent is trying to get the third base up and normally if you would have gone for Rudge Ravager or Ling Bane or Muna Ling Bane or whatever, you would have been in a great position because you can probably just roll over at your opponent. Now, in this particular case, I finished up my upgrades, I decide to still go for it, I got a heck of a lot of Zerklings, and I push forward. Now, this is a pretty clear-cut decision um, to do when you have the massive amounts of upgrades finish up, right? Uh, in this particular instance, though, my opponent just simply has a little bit too many units and he's too well upgraded and there's a lot of meta effects. I can't counter it. I can't beat this, right? I just simply don't have enough stuff. I think if we would have gone with anything like Roach Ravager or Mutaling Bane, I would have easily cleaned it up here. Uh, but at the very least, you know, the early game defense was really, really solid. Once again, still got a lot of queens out. Cruise Fred is still looking powerful. But I think in most scenarios, I would have won the game right then and there. Now, I was going for uh, a second lair there on accident, did end up cancelling that. And I'm gonna go ahead and close or be close to finishing up the hive here already. I didn't, um, I didn't actually kill all too many units from him, and I also made the mistake here of not really droning up nearly as greedily as I should be. But at the 10 minute mark, I got the Ultra Cavern going up, I got my plus 3, plus 3 upgrades happening in the Evolution Chambers, and very shortly, I will also be starting up the Adrenal Glance upgrade for Zerklings. And honestly, this is the moment where I am most vulnerable. Now, knowing that I just cleaned up my opponent's uh, army, I'm actually feeling pretty good. I'm actually feeling pretty powerful in this position because this is the moment where I'm most vulnerable, right? I just spent roughly like, I don't know, a thousand minerals and a thousand gas to get all these units going up in several minutes from now. Um, in this particular case, I, I know that I'm gonna be vulnerable, but at the same time, since I pushed out when plus two plus tech finished up, uh, or plus two plus two upgrades finished up, I'm gonna be in an okay situation because I traded relatively evenly here. Now here's a little trip, I guess, when you're playing this sort of, uh, when you're playing this sort of, um, uh, play style and you are running with a relatively mobile army, if you are seeing one drop coming towards your base, automatically split up your units to go towards another direction. So notice I'm not using my entire army here to clean up these, you know, this, this little group of marines. I'm immediately moving part of my army away here so I can eventually also pick up a second dropship. So just a little tip here, immediately once you see one dropship come in, immediately assume there's gonna be a second one on the way as well because good players or at least most good Terran players will go ahead and try their very best to uh, to um, do a double prong push almost every time and that's also the reason why I'm positioning the Queens that are, the way that I am. So I got different groups of Zerklings everywhere, I got two hotkeys for the Zerklings just sort of pretending it's gonna be a Mutaling Bane composition but I'm already getting my Ultras now. Got my Ultra Disc on the way, got plus 3, plus 3 on the way, got Adrenal Glands as well as the Chitinous Plating upgrade for the Ultras on the way, and everything considered, I was actually rather impressed with the way this game worked out thus far. Now obviously I know I was pretty vulnerable in many situations, but it does show you that in many, in many occasions, right, unit composition is only part of the equation. As long as you're doing some relatively... Uh, mechanical play and you're aware of when you should be drawing up and when you should be getting units instead and when you're gonna be you know powerful enough to attack and when you should be hanging back I think if you manage to follow those mechanics and you follow those basic Zerg rules, you can get away with many army compositions. I know a lot of people obsess over, well, should I be making 8 Hydras or should I be making 12, right? Like, where, where should I, you know, draw the line? In many scenarios, that's really not what you want to be doing. Focus on the basics and in, you know, almost 99% of the situations, that is one of, what is going to be allowing you to pick up the victory. At the very least, I think you can, you can win games purely off of mechanics. Until like, I don't know, probably until like mid-masters, low-masters, or at the very least like, you're gonna be able to climb the ladder quite easily by just following basic Zerg rules and, you know, basic Zerg macro. Either way though, going off on a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a tantrum there, I'm trying at this point in the game to push out when plus three plus three uh, finishes up. One of the most important things to do as a Zerg player is figure out when your opponent is gonna be expanding next. And in order to um, in order to do so, I'm trying to control the different fort base locations that he has by, by simply just putting my overlords on there. So I know you could either expand over here, or you could expand over here, or obviously the middle side of the map. Now as you can see, Creep has in the meantime arrived towards the middle of the side of the map, and I'm not really too worried about that. 
At the same time, though, I'm trying my very best here uh, to make sure that I get my queens across the map, too. And like I said, I made those queens really early on into the game, right? And they've all saved up a lot of energy. I got a ton of transfuse ready to go here. That's gonna make the ultra display so much easier. And I'm getting four more ultras. I am actually near maxed out. I think I could have actually gotten away with a bunch more workers. Really was kind of low on drones in this game. Looking back at the game right now, I was just a little bit low on income, I guess. Um, but either way... I can be using those queens that I made initially, right, in order to deal with all of the aggression that my opponent is going to be capable of doing right now. Imagine he would have been pushing, right, and my queens were going to be allowed to engage on creep. Things would have been so, so, so very easy. There was no way he would have barely been able to do very much. Now, there are liberators, the uh, Ultra Disc Arc Nemesis. I know that this is not going to be easy, but I got Transfuse ready to go, and I keep my Ultras alive for as long as I possibly can. Gotta be mowing through as much of this as I possibly can get my hands on. Ultralisk walking past the liberation zones. Queens are getting close to it, however, and I'm gonna try and transfuse as many of my units here as possible. Gotta start moving towards the third base, and I'm adding on more and more army here. Now, sadly, this one liberator did manage to do a heck of a lot of damage. He actually cleaned up 16 workers there, making the situation, as far as the worker goes, even more terrible for me. But we cleaned up all of the economy that he really still had left over, just by playing pure queen, pure ultralisk, and a bunch of Zirkling as well. Now, I was feeling the uh, I was feeling the heat here a little bit. I mean, my opponent wasn't going to be leaving the game just yet. And since I, I really don't have any proper anti-air, um, you know, because I'm obviously not allowed to really make any here, I do get a little bit anxious about the scenario here. I clean up most of the economy that it has, but at the end of the game, just because I don't want to be losing my hard-earned ladder points, right? I decide to still add on the... Uh, I still decide to uh, add on the uh, the Spire as well, just because... I asked the people in the stream, I was like, well, guys, what, what do I do if he goes like, you know, 12, 14, uh, 16 Liberator, right? I literally have no counter to that at all. Queens just simply can't touch it. So near the end of the game, I do add on a Spire to potentially go for Corruptor if it turns out to be necessary. I don't think I actually made any this game, although I can't, I can't promise that. But either way, though, like I think this should showcase to you that if you stick to the very basics, right, and you have reasonable control and reasonable game knowledge, things should be not that difficult. You don't need to obsess over the most hardcore of strategies. As long as you just make sure that you get your ultra list or you get your upgrades out, you push out when your upgrades finish up, and there you do see my spire, by the way. But you focus on these very basic things, such as drone timings, such as unit timings, and such as, um, you know, proper, proper timing pushes, really. You're gonna be A-OK, -okay, and you're gonna be capable of winning games against players that are maybe mechanically better than you, but just by simply following the rules, or like the basic rules, you're gonna be very, very, very powerful and potentially winning all the games that you wanna be playing. Now my Ultra Disc do get cornered here for a little bit. Still gonna be able to claw away at a bunch of these, uh, bunch of these bio units. And as you can see, like, I got a stun of army still happening here. I'm trying my very best to prevent my opponent from having any more continued mining. And at this point in the game, he's got, well, he's got zero Harvesters. He's got absolutely none. Obviously, Terran does still have Mule, so I'm a little bit worried for this base. Sending the reinforcing units as well as the reinforcing Queens, which I did, by the way, go ahead and remake uh, towards the uh, towards his potential fort base right now. But this is basically where the game is over, right? This is basically where the game is ending. So long story short, right? Why I would still recommend everyone uh, that is in the lower leagues. Uh, and basically anyone up to like, you know, maybe, maybe Grandmaster League, because then you don't really need any of my help at the very least, I probably need yours. But I would recommend anyone that plays uh, Zork vs. Terran at, you know, a reasonable level to play Road Ravager. I think it's the strongest all-round composition. But long story short, don't obsess over all the litty, little nitty-gritty details. If you follow basic rules, right, you can imagine, like, since I'm playing against pretty high level people here, like I'm definitely playing against top 500 players in the world here. I, I know that I'm not playing it perfectly and I know I'm making plenty of mistakes here, but as long as you focus on the basics and you're making sure that you follow those basic Zerg guidelines, you should be A-OK, -okay just defeating opponents. This week, or like, like, it doesn't matter what unit composition you're gonna be, what, what, you, what you're gonna be focusing around or what tech route you're deciding to choose and um, what, what like timings you're, you're specifically going for. As long as you follow the basics, I think you should be a-okay. 
anyhow, I hope you enjoyed watching this game. If you haven't already, do make sure you hit that like button down below. And if you want to see more content like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And with that, I want to thank you all for watching. Have an amazing day. Do not forget to smile, all right? And I'll see you in the next one. Bye!